Well, it is a great honor for me to have some very dear friends with us today, Dr. Al and Laura Robbins. Uh, 30 years ago, this coming year, I enrolled in Bible College at Faith School of Theology in Maine, and Dr. Al was one of my instructors at Bible School. Actually, Laura was one of my instructors at Bible School. Um, he was also the Dean of Men. Uh, over dinner last night, um, he learned about all kinds of goings-on on campus that he didn't know about when he was the Dean of Men and I was a student. And uh, he was also our gym teacher. And uh, after I graduated from Faith School of Theology, he just couldn't stand being there without me. So uh, he left the faculty and became a pastor. He has planted churches. Um, he has served as a police officer for seven years. Uh, he's good friends with our friend Tommy Barnett and Matthew Barnett. And he served on the staff of the LA Dream Center, uh, where some of us have gone and ministered. Pastor Al is also an author. Um, he has two books. One is called Acorn Dropped, and the other book is called The Acorn Chronicles. It's a devotional. Now, the greedy, greedy people at the Saturday evening service and the 8.30 service bought out all the books, and so uh, I think there's some copies on the table out there for display, uh, but if you'd like to have a book, uh, we'll put your name on a list, and we would love, they'll ship us some books uh, down from Berwick, Maine, where they live. But I wonder if you would just stand on your feet for one moment and give your best Harvest Time welcome for our very dear friend, Dr. Al and Laura Robbins. Hey, Amen. You may be seated. I just told your pastor I think that is a fake resume. It sounded better to me <laughs> than living it. Come on, I appreciate it. He just loves us, thank God. I'm just a guy from Maine, and I'm just honored to be here. I have uh, traveled all my life. I had a non-resident father for a while, and uh, uh, you know, it didn't look good. My dad was an abusive alcoholic and uh, left my mom and my sister and I when I was five. Uh, I don't know why he did it like this, but he married a woman with five kids <laughs> if he thought he had trouble. You know what I mean? These guys, they jump ship and they think, ooh, 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 that grass looks green. But hey, years later, I led my dad to Christ. <laughs> And this violent old man that I've seen three cruisers come to take him out of the house when I'd visit him in California. And uh, I'd see this violent old man in church. He was a boxer and a lumberjack and a carpenter and all that. And he, he could fight anybody or any amount of people. And in his older years, those last 20 years or so, he would just stand in church crying. Every service he would say, son, that was the greatest you've ever preached. <laughs> oh, I just feel such love here. He was a wimp when he died. It was awesome, man. He wasn't violent. He wasn't bitter. He wasn't angry. Uh, and, and it was just great, man. He would bring up his past, Pastor Glenn. He'd say, I'm so sorry for what I did to you and your mom and sister. And I would say, Dad, I, I don't know what you're talking about. He would say, no, I was miserable. He said, I, I, I loved the bottle. I was addicted. He, he had drank since he was a teenager, you know, went and fought in World War II, almost died there drunk in an alley being escorted by two German officers and French citizens jumped out and never told me the full story, but he's alive and uh, saved his life. And he said, I'm so sorry for what I did. And I would say, Dad, haven't I taught you yet that I don't know what you're talking about? I said, everything's under the blood now. And God fixes it all. Don't go back and dig it up, Dad. Because I'm, I, I'm not bothered by it. And God used it anyway. Because the devil cannot take anything from God's plan. Even if it looks like a distraction or a derailment, the train is going to get into the station. So hang in there. Thank you, Jesus. 
And my, my poor dad is smiling in heaven today because I told only half the story this morning. Yeah, you know, he was an abusive alcoholic. He, no, he got saved later, and we did, we did life together. It was awesome. But I, I thank God for rescuing me. And, and uh, shortly after dad left, uh, uh, my pastor's wife, we had no church then, and just my mom, my sister, and me, and my Pentecostal grandmother, I still have her old prayer rocking chair that became my mother's. Now I use it every morning. Today I used a bathtub in the side hotel bathroom so I wouldn't wake up my, my bride this morning. But as she was slain out completely, uh, just, I mean, God must have touched her sometime during the night. Uh, is it all right to have fun in church? Is that all right? I, I'm just real. I'm transparent, and I'm real transparent. So you'll have to put up with me uh, two more services. Then they're kicking me out of here, but not before spoiling us in New York City tomorrow. And I won't tell you what we're going to do because we don't know it all yet, but I'm like a kid, man. Four o'clock this morning, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> and I'm telling the devil, leave me alone. I'm trying to study. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, maybe we should go to the early. There's like 11 o'clock matinee. That gives us more time to see things in the day. Not that I'm old or anything, but if I'm in there at night, I'm going to be like this. <laughs> oh, Times Square. So what? I'm exhausted. <laughs> Come on. Used to make fun of friends that go to bed at 8 o'clock. Now I say, man, how do they stay up that late? I can't believe it. <laughs> We're all right. And those of you that make fun of us, if you'd get up when we got up, you'd go to bed before midnight too. <laughs> now that Jay Leno's off, there's nothing that funny in my opinion. But anyway. All right, I've visited enough. I have a girl that's been following me since I was 11. She wrote me a note in church. I guess I was only 12 at the time. It said, I'm 11, I'll be 12 July 9th. Do you like me, Mary, or Beth? Circle one. <laughs> I've been circling her every, ever since. Honey, would you stand and wave? And... <laughs> if, uh... I don't even know if in heaven if I'm going to be able to be on the same street with her because she's amazing. All my friends that have known me for years know it. They, they think something's wrong with her that she's stuck with me all these years. Uh, I'm grateful. You know, God told me years ago, <laughs> he'd give me the desires of my heart. My desires, my wife and my kids. <laughs> And I still got her. She says, I still got you, honey, because the poor you have with you always, Jesus said. So, <laughs> come on. Yeah, that, that's a joke, by the way. We're fine. Hey, the kind of lady she is, she is uh, uh, the first seven years after we graduated, we taught at this missions Bible college that your pastor mentioned for no salary. What kind of wife will work and minister with a guy for no salary? Without one complaint. Had three kids together during that time when people said, it, it can't happen. You can't afford kids. Well, if we'd waited, we'd still be waiting. Kids have gone up. How many of you know, tell your neighbor, kids have gone up. Come on. I don't know what's happened. Worse than gasoline, anyway. Uh, <laughs> They put on a report, you know, they want to drop the population statistics, put on that report they did months ago as to what it takes to birth a child and get them through college. Forget it. I say I'm get down to Kmart as a greeter, get this over with, get them working, age six. I say we lower the employment standard. <laughs> All three kids are in ministry. My son is, is pastoring. Uh, a multi-church site. He's one of the, the, the campus pastors uh, there in Maine and New Hampshire. They're, they're growing faster than weeds. They're doing great. They're running a few thousand, planning uh, three more churches this year. I tell them they're living my dream. They're ahead of me. I literally want to take them all hostage and use his team to plant more churches myself. But I, I don't think Jesus would smile at that. So he uh, just lets me watch and enjoy our youngest daughter. Just had our first grandson in July. 
She uh, moved to Henderson, Nevada. Her husband is a youth pastor there, and they work with youth. And uh, we're just believing to see them. In about two weeks, they're coming to visit in Maine. And then our, our oldest daughter, uh, I lost her simply because I gave out some free Starbucks coupons to four, uh, six veterans, Navy guys that are active duty that I saw going into a Portsmouth, New Hampshire Starbucks, uh, I don't know, three, four years ago. And I said, look guys, I'm a local pastor. I'm not a veteran. I'm not trying to gain points with you. We'll never see each other again. I just want you to know how much I appreciate you as a veteran. My father served in World War II, my father-in-law in the Korean War, and I'm just grateful. Thank you. Here's some free coffee bags that'll get you free coffee, and thanks so much. As I'm walking to my truck, one guy followed me and said, where do you pastor? I said, oh, it's about 15 minutes up the road. He said, we're stationed on a submarine here in Portsmouth in the Kittery Naval Shipyard, Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. We're looking for a church. I'm from California, so you hear a lot of people say, we'll be there, you know. Oh, you have little faith. He was there that Sunday. Brought three guys. Uh, he was one who recommitted his life to Christ and became one of our worship leaders. And then he went and married my little girl and they've moved. <laughs> so, I have, part of me is against outreach, part of me. <laughs> Actually, I'm thrilled. I prayed for him on the phone yesterday. We're talking about uh, the call of God in his life when he gets out of the Navy, and which is in about a year and a half. And he, he's just got a real hard and gentle spirit. And, and he has to because I can still take him anyway. I know I can. I got like one good fight left. But anyway, thank God. I used to bench 400, Pastor Glenn, like 11 years ago. And now I weigh 400. Amen. <laughs> Every five feet, someone's offering me food when I'm down here. <laughs> Man, I, 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 last night we're going to be good, and we went to that Italian restaurant. I'll talk about it later, but my goodness. Can I confess something? You confessed to me. I, I, I told uh, Philip, is Philip here? I, I told him last night, I said, Man, your pastor was a model student. Never had issues. I was Dean of Man, all that. And now he's confessing things to me last night. I almost had to leave. He, he and these guys would go down. I'm telling it. I don't care. They'd go down to the local church to pray because we were a real strict school. You couldn't leave campus. And he said, did you know I went every day I drove a half hour to Bangor to get coffee? I mean, we're talking the woods of Maine. You ain't got nothing up there, boys. There's nothing. Just trees and deer and moose and everything. You got to go a half hour to get a good coffee. But you couldn't leave campus. It was pretty strict. They'd go down to the local church because you were allowed to pray. And then I was security chief. He volunteered to work on security. Uh, two or three of my guys would, after everyone's gone to bed, they'd drive a half hour to go get coffee. Come on. <laughs> I won't even get into the mashed potato fight in the kitchen that I learned about. This morning we had breakfast coupons. Well, I can't, we'll be okay. You know, we've been on that, you've been ever heard about that paleo diet? Paleo diet? You know, my son's got me on that. We're good for him. But I think my trouble is I do like Atkins and paleo and deal a meal and Nutrisystem and I do it all at once and I figured doing five or six things at once, I should drop it like that. But. I think I've crossed things up. When we get up there to breakfast this morning at the hotel, it's an all-you-can-eat. They make your omelet. Come on, guys. What's going on? I get to his office. There's bagels, cream cheese. I got a muffin in my coat right now. I brought in case things go long. Anyway, we got to get down to business. I just wanted to visit and open up your emotions before I drop the bomb on you. Amen. <laughs> He gets you, don't you love it? <laughs> and that's now. Here's what the Bible says. <laughs> Thanks for making us feel at home. The book, by the way, is about those seasons we go through when uh, you feel like you're an acorn. It's a little allegory. You can read it in 45 minutes. Uh, it's just a simple book. It's from the perspective of an acorn that's hanging out on, hanging out on Father Tree. And Father Tree says, you're going to be awesome. Has God ever given you a great promise? 
this is going to happen. I'm going to do that. And you're smiling. And the other acorns are saying, yeah, you, you got some gifts he's giving you. It's gonna, I heard what God said. It's gonna, everyone's confirming it. It's sunny. You're up on the tree. It's wonderful. The forest creatures are commenting. It's, everything's great. And before you get to the blooming of your acorn, you've got to drop to the ground in the dirt and die. I don't like that. But if we'll hang in there, he'll bring beauty for ashes. He'll bring joy for mourning. He'll bring you through everything you need to go through. I heard a lot of testimonies from people in between ministries that are hurting, that have been through stuff. And uh, just read two or three pages and just break down weeping. And that it brought a lot of healing to them. Because it, it's a, just a, a little way of expressing that. My favorite testimony is a couple of months ago. I met a man in northern Maine who had lost everything. He was unsaved, living with a girl, had some kids with her. His dad died, willing him a camp on the lake and a house and money. And he lost all this to his girlfriend. He lost everything he had. And this pastor friend of mine in Millinocket, uh, buys these by the case and gives them out to people in need because he does a lot of street ministry and ministry to the needy, Pastor Herschel Hafford. And this guy came in one day and he gave him this book and he said, no matter what you're going through, read this little book and the scripture that's in there and it'll give you a different perspective. This guy got saved and about two months ago I was preaching there. He shook my hand off after church and said, look at this, and pulled a bent dog-eared copy with different portions highlighted out of his genes and said, this thing helped me to come to Christ. That, that's worth every hour, every mile, every piece of it. So if you need one, get it. If you don't have money for one, I realize I'm stepping out in faith. I don't want you not to order one. We're out of them, I guess, but I don't want you not to order one because of money. Maybe you're in a tough spot. I'd like to get you a book. I'll do my best. So just sign up with Sister Faith. Father, we thank you for your word today. We bind any hindrance. We already feel liberty. We loose the powers of the Holy Spirit to continue to saturate us. Give us clarity of thinking to deliver your word and give us a clear spirit to receive. We cast down every imagination and we bring into captivity every thought because you have destined this moment. Lord, we don't look at this as, well, it's just another Sunday. God, we look at this as a special part of our year. It's the last Sunday. And you have something good for us that you've put together. It's not a sermon. It's a message. And you knew who would be here and who wouldn't. And you're going to use this. There are going to be some people that leave today that will be different from direct results of your word. And we claim that and speak it and believe it and we add your blessing right now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 In Mark chapter 8, I'm going to read from my old King James Beater Bible that my kids would say, Dad, don't bring that in the pulpit. But we, we've had the toughest year that we've ever had in 37 years of man, ministry and marriage. And when you go through a tough season, you run a little more frequently to your old prayer chair. <laughs> Come on, you wear out your prayer shawl and you, you wear this thing out. So don't buy me another one. I preached at a church once, I used this, and they surprised me at the end of the revival meeting with a brand new Bible. And I took it, but I'm sorry. I got some new Bibles, but you know, it just when you've been through, when you, there, there's prophetic words in the back of this from the 70s that God gave me. And other little notes when, man, I was a freshman in Bible college in, in the late 70s. And this is preached anywhere from Canada to New Mexico to Florida, Ohio, all through New England. So it means something to me today. And, and I've read this thousands of times, literally, but it is lately... God has been stirring this in my spirit and he's been challenging me with this passage. In Mark chapter 8, it says, Jesus cometh to Bethsaida, verse 22. And they bring a blind man unto him and they besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I... 
Who has, anybody have NIV? What does it say Jesus did? Spit. It says spit in NIV. I thought it was just my old King James today. Does anybody have new living? What did Jesus do? Who has new living? A spat, so spit, spat, spot, whatever, he spit. Wow. Amplified? That'd be like three words describing spit. So what I'm getting at is this. I'm not lost. I know where I'm headed, but there's no way around it. It wasn't line up here and we're going to anoint the center of your forehead with just a little drop of oil. You're going to go over here and it's going to happen. Wow, man. He spit in his eyes. Hello? That is not going to go on your next Miracle Crusade flyer. <laughs> Folks, come on out tonight. We have, you know how we try to box God in? He's going to do it a certain way. And then you get some nut who's doing it professionally. I've been in this a long time. You ever seen those? You know you have, Pastor. They're going to market it. Miracle wheat or miracle mud or miracle spit. You know what I'm saying? We're not going to box God in. He spit in his eyes and then he said, can you see anything? And the man said, I see men, but it's as trees walking. And the NIV or the New Living says, yes, he said, I see people, but I can't see them very clearly. The contemporary English version reads, I see people, but they look like trees walking around. And, and if you just kind of squint for a second, will you help me for a second? Just kind of squint. And that's probably about what he saw. It's like, I can see people, but I, I, I see, but I can't quite see, but I, I see men as trees walking. And so Jesus said, well, that's good enough. Oh, no, no. The man said, oh, man, that's a lot better than before. Uh, you led me out of the village and, and, and I can see a lot better than I could. And so that's fine. I think I'm going to go back now with my friends. Is that what happened? No, Jesus touched him again and it said he could see all men clearly. Then I love verse 26. I think sometimes Jesus just had fun. He said, go back, go home, but don't go to the town and don't tell anybody what happened. What was he doing, man? You're going to take a guy that's been blind and you're going to say, shh, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. Sometimes I think he liked to have fun. I'm sorry, that might be my imagination. But I think he knew our human nature. What happens when somebody tells us, now listen Al, don't say a word, but I got to tell my wife, she's got to tell her mom, we got to, they got to call my kids and say, did you know what your dad said to your mom who told me? Did they tell you yet? And then one daughter calls the other, doesn't they call my brother? And my brother says, why didn't you tell me? My son says, why didn't you tell me? Come on, you know how we are. So by him saying, don't say a word, man, that's the greatest publicity in the world. If you want it told, simply say, brother, don't say a word. It's gonna, this side's going to have it in 30 seconds. The other side's going to have it. And 25 people are all going to have it in the news paper by this afternoon hot off the press. I don't know I'm imagining but I just think it's cool to look at that for a minute. The bottom line is they brought a blind man to him and he led him out of the city, out of the familiar. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. And then he did something for him that was his desperate need for years and then he, he did it in a way that was no way to copy it, duplicate it, replicate it. He just did it in a way that I I bet you somewhere over the last 2,000 years somebody has tried it and ended up in a fist fight. <laughs> I promise you today, when your pastor and I pray for you after, nobody's going to spit on you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that had to be Jesus. That was a unique thing. The chapter before, he came to a deaf guy and he put his fingers in his ear back in Mark 7 and then he spit on his tongue. I don't know what was going around, but... There are times when Jesus did it different ways. And God is working in your life differently, in my life differently. And there are times we look at our friend was healed. And I'm having surgery. Great. <laughs> Same God. I'm your child. 
Yeah, I know. <laughs> I love you. I got a plan. He's not confused. You'll never see God pacing. Oh, no. Did you hear what the dentist told him? <laughs> I, I had an estimate two weeks ago, and I literally told the receptionist, I said, are you kidding me? Are you going to throw in a bypass and a hip replacement? I said, I'm 56. My whole body isn't worth that much. I'll get back to you. I mean, I'd rather have a, a, a classic Corvette or a Mustang Cobra or something. Learjet, you know, a palace, uh, you know. Come on, you're with me. I know you are. Listen. Three things quickly. We're talking about men as trees walking. Number one, none of us has arrived yet. God isn't finished. God isn't done. And the biggest mistake we can find ourselves in, especially at year end, is looking back to, by the way, how many are planning on being here for New Year's Eve Wednesday night? And I'm not going to ask, don't raise your hand to this, but how many say, why bother? I was here New Year's Eve 2013, and I left this altar saying, this is your year, this is your year, this is the year, this is the year, and, and it's been the toughest year ever. Now, you're not feeling quite like that, but don't say you haven't had moments. Why even pray, somebody says. Because God is hearing every time, and he's going to answer, and it may not be exactly what we think, but we will look back, and we will come to the realization that it was his plan, not ours. And if we'd had our way, it would have been a mess. I have often said, Lord, if you ever have an opening on your advisory panel... I'll volunteer. He has never asked my advice. Only facetiously to make me look at... So you would like to do this? Do you want to do that? Or do you want to trust me? And he knows I'm going to say, yeah, I really want to do that, but I think I'll trust you. God does it differently, and the enemy would like to tell us, well, you've had a rough year, 2014, so don't get all worked up. I guess your little dream was nothing but a pipe dream. It's tight, but it's right. Come on. Don't judge God by what you see. God is not finished. Don't judge God by the fact that he's leading you by the hand out of your comfort zone, away from your friends and family and your routine. If you're blind, routine is pretty important to you. And rather than, could not Jesus have said, boom, you're healed. There he was, man. Jesus took him by the hand and led him outside of the city. And then he spit in his eyes and then the blind man had enough faith to allow him to lead him and then to spit not once but twice and by following what was uncomfortable under the direction of Jesus great things were accomplished he received his lifetime miracle when it looked impossible Listen, it may be tough. You may be homeless or jobless or have marital issues. There may be tough reports from your doctors there may be uncertainty in your life and your future and you don't know where you're going to be next week or how you're going to make your car payment or you'd sign up for insurance but they'd laugh at you. <laughs> Come on. You just can't. You're just like it. tough reports and problems with a spouse or, or your kids are challenged or maybe like my mom, you're a single parent. Years later, my mom married a great godly man who's still alive today. Great man. Love him dearly. He was the most gentle man I've ever met. He took care of my mother. He nurtured her. One of the greatest honors of my life was about the last five years of the lives of my parents. Both sets of parents attended the same church. Woo! Baby, that was amazing. <laughs> Mom and dad and Ma and Pa. It was just a big mix. Thank God. Nobody punched anybody. It was awesome, man. They got along and they went forward. And now half of them, both my real mom and my real dad, are with Jesus. But in the interim, we have these challenges. We, we need to remember we, where we're at is not the end. He's not finished. The enemy whispers, you're too old. Have you ever had the problem I've had where you hear the voice that says, you'll never lose weight? Now, to some of you that are fine, 
uh, that's a big battle for some of us. Now, I'll never lose weight hanging around here, I'll tell you that right now, because I love to eat. I do like, that's why I never drank or smoked or did drugs. I couldn't have handled it. I would have been dead in like 15 minutes. <laughs> Like at Christmas, my wife made molasses donuts because I wanted them in memory of my dad. They're the kind of thing you only eat like once a year because they're weird. But I ate all four of them on Christmas. <laughs> I told your pastor, I love cheese. You can't have it on that paleo diet. So I've been stuck at around 150, a little more than 150. Anyway, um, <laughs> I've been stuck. So like I asked my wife, if I wear this shirt today, does it make me look fat? She said, no, it's not the shirt. It's not the shirt. No. No, she didn't do that. She didn't do that. I told her, look, I'll never leave you after 37 years. Look at me. I can't get anything for my trade in. Look at me. I'm not going anywhere now. We've been through too much together. Come on. Christmas Eve, I had a block of cheese, Pastor. <laughs> Come on, am I the only? I'm up here airing my laundry. Anybody else like cheese? Thank you. The, glory to God. There's a cheese family here. After service, we're going to have a, just a little cheese luncheon together. I started on that Asiago, and what they got me was it was two for four dollars. So I got the regular, you know, cheddar and. I started with the Triscuits, and I won't tell you how many Triscuits I had, because you've got to have cheese and Triscuits and mix it and just change your whole life. I'm looking down. Somebody in my recliner while I was eating had eaten the whole thing, and there was nobody there except me. I don't know what happened. <laughs> but you've got to keep getting up. You've got to not think, no, I can't. You can. You can keep going. Maybe you've struggled with some addiction. You can break it. One of these times will be the last time you put the cigarettes down. Yeah. I told a man in my church that. He said, when I would go visit him, he was working on, I had an old postal jeep that I painted all camo. It was worth like 500 bucks, but I loved it. It was fun in the woods and on the road. And you'd go to make a corner and that sliding side door would just whoom. It was old. It was out of the 70s. I had a ball. He's working on the motor. I showed up at his house and under, he saw the pastor coming. He was new to my church. So he dropped his cigarette and it rolled under my engine. I said, Roland, I don't care. I know you're struggling with that. I'm struggling with this. I know you're trying to quit, but keep your cigarettes from under my wonderful Jeep. Come on. And I told him, and it took him a few years. I said, Roland, one of these days you're going to smoke your last cigarette. And that's been almost 20 years because he kept getting up and getting up and getting up and getting up because it isn't over. It's never too late. It's never too late to change. My dad was intoxicated all the time till age 46 in California. He went to an AA meeting and eventually he got help through a higher power. And a few years later, I was able to introduce him to the name of the higher power. <laughs> the higher, 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 higher power. And God used him in AA, and some of his AA friends got saved in our church. Thank you, Jesus. It's not too late. You can change. A just man falleth seven times and riseth again. It's the getting up. I don't care if you made a list. Listen, I'm sorry, don't even make a list. Just come to Jesus, turn it over to him, and at one point you look back and say, man, I don't even want to do that stuff anymore. I, I can't believe I used to do that as a Christian, but now it's just different. God is going to do something and interrupt your world in the name of Jesus. Somebody's going to leave here today with God delivering you from chains that keep jumping back on you. They're going to stay here, and we're going to throw them in the basement of that church. Come on. We're going to bury him in Jesus' name. Don't stop with partial spiritual vision in your life. Don't stop with men as trees walking. God isn't finished yet. I love your church. I'm between churches. I would have loved your old bubble out here. I drove in to show my wife and I forgot. I saw it because Facebook is the pipeline for everything. I saw that you took the bubble down. What did you do with it? <laughs> did you bury it? 
Come on. Made a pool out of it over to the pastors probably. I saw that over a year ago. I brought my wife around. The bubble's gone. The bubble's gone. That, that would have been a great church in Maine, but it would have lasted about a week in the winter, I think, with the heavy snows. But man, you could have stayed at that. You could stay at this. This is fine. We got a few hundred people here. That's great. We got triple services. So what? What are we doing out there? Digging up a hole and, and now we're interrupting the routine. <laughs> I've sat in that seat over 40 years, Gladys, and I'm going to sit there again. <laughs> My family donated to row 15. And I will sit on the in seat as long as I'm alive. Now, where are you get? I don't know. Your pastor didn't tell me anybody's story. I've pastored. I've preached 37 years. I've seen this. I've heard it. I've gone to set in some of those seats and had a lady who couldn't hear well in her 80s say, John, John, those teenagers, they're in our row. <laughs> that was really, that almost turned us from Jesus that day. But we just politely moved and, oh. I'm still better God right now. Release that. That was 50 years ago. Anyway, 30, 40 years ago. I see where, I see men as trees walking would be stopping right here. Church in the Midwest a few years ago voted not to allow in any more members. Wow, that's awesome. What an outreach based nothing. Perhaps they'd lost one of their daughters to some guy through an outreach. <laughs> oh, you're catching up with me. Come on, you're catching up with me. I pastored a church, my first church years ago that had been there 52 years. The, I think everyone's dead now, so I can tell this. Uh, the first, the founding pastor, it was a house that was converted to a church. And there were so many things, man. I'll tell you all of them later when we have a couple of days together or something. But uh, one of the things was we had to expand the sanctuary. And I did it in a week. We knocked out the back walls, changed a, a paralam beam, took everything out, had it all carpeted and finished between Sundays. I, I do a lot of carpentry. That week I worked 111 hours of just carpentry plus preach Sunday, Wednesday. Woo! I was really valuable the next Sunday when I preached. But I'm glad I was there. We got it done. And, and the next Sunday, if people miss the Sunday before in the business meeting and they come walk... I still see the look on some of them. I st they missed it. So you skip church? Don't miss next week. That could be done the way things are going. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and in that business meeting, one of the founding pastor's daughters said, why are we doing this? She hated change. We had to cut down a pine tree that daddy had planted to block the wind on their bedroom on the back side of the building. I'm sorry. I love trees. I love heritage. I love stories. I got toys from when I was a kid. I understand it. But the tree was in the way. And are we going to say, oh dear Lord, we would grow, but we just can't kill that pine tree. <laughs> After all, there's only 40 billion of them in Maine. But that one, you understand that her father planted that when she was a child. So let's just keep them out. One thing she said at the meeting was, she's fine. She will never hear this. She's with Jesus right now. She's probably watching me right now and laughing because she was a dear lady. But she said during the meeting, well, what if somebody gets hurt during, during this construction? Well, what if a plane comes in right now and we blow up? What if the earth opens up a sinkhole? What, you know, what if I get a rash and scratch myself to death right now during the sermon? <laughs> What if that three cheese omelet kicks in and I drop right here? <laughs> she said, Pastor, she now stood up and said, Pastor, I just think if people want a seat, they need to learn to come early. <laughs> well, that sounds good. So we're all saved and our kids are in here and everything's fine. Let's just lock the doors. <laughs> I'm sure that's the heart of God. 
well, let's just work the worship team and a pastor. Let's add a fifth and sixth and seventh Sunday morning service. Come on. I don't see that here. I see people that are aggressively saying, let's keep pursuing, keep pursuing, keep pursuing. Let's go bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Why? Because it might be one of my kids that gets saved. It might be one of your kids. It might be my neighbor. It might be an uncle. It might be a friend of mine. That one more chair could make the difference. One more chair could make the difference. Isn't this, isn't this worship team doing a fine job? And they do, they do five services a weekend, four, four services a weekend. Come on, guys. Let's bless them. Let's finish it. <laughs> Let's give them a break. Let's bless them. Let's bless your pastor. Do we want to keep our pastor around? I think so. I've had double services, but I've never had a Saturday night and then three on a Sunday morning. I think I have four or five left to go today. Come on. <laughs> Whatever you're going through, God isn't finished yet. Don't you dare quit. Don't give up. I don't care what happened with 2014. Do you know in a football game, which as good believers, we're going to watch one this afternoon, I'm sure, whatever. <laughs> I will have you out by the kickoff. But anyway, uh, in a football game, a lot of games are lost in the second half. Because teams give up in the first half. And so many comebacks occur because some people like you who decided not to stay home but to come to church, give God 100% to finish this year right. I will not skip church. I'm discouraged. I'm hurting. I'm crying in the night. I got a bad report from the doctor. I don't understand it. I thought I'd be debt free this year and it got deeper and deeper. Some side issues happened, you know. I had something on my car. I thought it was an oil change and it was like $3,500 later you know what I mean have you been there and guess what I'm here I'm here because it's only half time God isn't finished yet it's only men as trees walking it's just a temporary season it's not the end of my book don't judge my book by chapter one don't look at one snapshot of your life and say it's over no God's got some more pictures your movie hasn't ended have you ever given up on a movie and said, I'm leaving or I'm not watching this? You change the channel to like QVC or something. And then your wife watched it in the other room. And the, she said, oh, you've got to get in. You're thinking, nah, and you get in. It was an awesome ending, but you thought it was junk. And that's how we are with God. But you're not because you're here. You're finishing strong. You said, I see men as trees walking. You did a lot of good things this year, Lord. But not everything that I needed you to finish is finished. So I'm going to keep going because you're not done. In the name of Jesus. You can't diet halfway. I just taught you that earlier. You can't half diet. I do great till noontime. You can't half. Either you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. I can't even do great all day. A carrot and a piece of lettuce and an ice cube. Nine o'clock, a half gallon of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Come on. <laughs> but we got Christians like that. Help us, God. Well, I ask God to do such and such. And you're not tithing. You're not praying. You're not reading the word. And you're skipping church just because you're feeling sorry for what you went through. I know nobody here is like that, but we have them in, in Maine. We have them in Maine. In fact, I've been one of them before. Have you ever said, let me see, come on, we, we need some transparency. Have you ever said, what's the use? I gave my best to God. I have, I have made $10,000 pledges to God, and three days later was given a brand new loaded $50,000 diesel Chevy Duramax diesel with a uh, uh, whatever, the eight-foot bed, four doors, so big you had to register it in three states. It was amazing. And I just made a pledge, and only my wife knew. We pledged three days early, and we said, we don't know how we're going to do it. We can't do that. We did it. Three days later, God says, okay, you're going to do it. Here, here you go. Here you go, son. Here, have some keys. And, and I'll pick that up in a minute. Sorry, Pastor. 
and, and God will just bless you. There are other times you make a pledge, you go through your coin drawer, you go into your truck or your car, you clean the ashtray out, and you get all the quarters out of there. Between the seats, you met the pledge, you got it done, and your furnace goes the next day, or your air conditioning, or your transmission. And the devil's saying, here yeah, you go, huh? Big pledge boy, you're something, huh? Huh, 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 huh? I had people say during our tough season, the acorn season, say, don't you wish you had those thousands back that you gave away? Huh? And I say, absolutely not. <laughs> no, God spoke and I did it and I have no regrets and neither does my wife in the name of Jesus. And I feel it here today that some of you are in a tough season. You've had a tough year, but you're not saying, God has been so bad, it's been awful. No, you've taken accountability because some of our problems are our own decisions. Yes. Please pass that on to the rest of the world, please. A lot of my stuff is Al Robbins' fault. The guy I shave every morning messes things up sometimes but God still loves me and God's going to fix it and God restores my soul and he's with me and he provides and he's not finished you can't swim halfway across a lake never mind I don't like it I don't feel like it well neither do I but we're dead center right now, and I don't know about you, I'm going to keep kicking, baby. I'm not giving up. In the name of Jesus, you can't be married. We didn't hit the 37-year mark last August 6th by being married 50% or 75 or 89.3. You work it. We were 18. She'd been 18 for less than a month. Oh, no, 32 days, I think. A lot younger than me. Listen, we got married, and when we'd fully adjusted to marriage, 30 days later went to Bible college. We've never ever considered divorce. We've considered homicide a few times. <laughs> I have had to pay off several hitmen that she's hired. Say, no, 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 I'll double your money. Come on. Eventually she calms down. It's been so rough. It's been amazing. <laughs> It's 100%, baby, on both parts. It's not even 50-50, sorry. 50-50 gets you nowhere. It's I love you, I'm committed, I'm with you. I, I might not be flipping over you today, but I'll be there tomorrow, baby. It's going to be all right. We're going to get through this. We're going to keep going. We're going to pay off our debt. We're going to raise our kids. We're going to pay off the college loan. We're going to get better jobs. We're going to get better housing. We're not here forever. This isn't it. None of it matters. We're going to invest eternally. We're going to reach people in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, lastly, sometimes we lose patience with God. I've got to hurry about two minutes. We're about two minutes, Pastor. Uh, we lose patience with God. We don't like the way he's doing it. Have you ever felt like he was leading you blind out of the city, out of the familiar, out of your comfort zone? And now you hear that noise indicating that somebody's about to spit? And now you feel moisture in not one but two eyes? You don't like God's method? I prefer when the guy came to Jesus and said, Hey, I got a, a sick child at home, and he says, just go back, I've already healed them. By the time you get there, they're fine. I like those miracles. <laughs> I love reading the stories about Abraham and Isaac. He gave God his Isaac. But he raised the knife. There was a ram. Hallelujah. I love those stories. <laughs> there are other times I've put Isaac down and he says, okay, thank you. <laughs> and you go back down the mountain and sometimes you question your decision, but he reminds you, no, you gave it to me. You wait till you see what I'm going to do. It's going to take a while to get back down the mountain and to get what I have for you. But you did what I asked you to do, and that's all I'm looking for is obedience. You may not like it. It may be uncomfortable. And then you can't just say, never mind. He's got more to do. And we begin to doubt. I know he said he would do such and such, but... But he didn't do it yet. Well, don't give up yet. 
Habakkuk 2, 3, 3 says, these things I plan won't happen right away. Slowly, steadily, surely, the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. And Pastor Glenn pointed out last night, all this time, this man was a man of faith because all he had was the hand of Jesus. And there will be times that it's dark and you can't see anything, but Jesus will never, ever, ever let go of your hand. If you're crying and praying in the middle of the night, he is going to hold your hand and he is not going to leave you until you have your final deliverance. He is a God of the impossible. He laughs at the word when we feel like it's impossible. Nothing is impossible to them that believe he's going to take care of it. Philippians 1, 6 says, I'm sure that God who began a good work in you is able to perform it. It gives God no glory and no honor if we walk out after the first time he touches us. God wants to bring us beyond and above our ministries walking. God wants us out of debt. He says he wants to prosper us and be in health even as our soul prospers. He said in John 10, 9 and 10 that the thief comes to kill, steal and destroy. But I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. God wants to give seed to the sower. The more we invest out in this building, God is going to honor us. He's going to honor the heart of this pastor in this church that says he'd be a lot more comfortable to back off, ease up, and take a break. We're doing fine. But not the eyes of a visionary, not the eyes of Jesus. You're looking out and seeing that finished already. In the name of Jesus, I wish I could preach from the bottom of that hole this morning and someday in the new building finish, I'm going to run it in Jesus' name because God isn't finished in the name of Jesus. Let's stand. Let's stand. Let's stand. Let's stand in Jesus' name. Last night we went to that restaurant. I don't know what all this food is all about. I must be getting hungry. But listen, they started us off at this Italian restaurant with bread. I love bread. If I go to like Longhorn Steakhouse, I eat two. Here I go. I'm going to the altar after. I eat two loaves of that wheat bread and the real butter. Real butter will change your life. Real butter. Forget this man-made synthetic. Listen, if I'm going to eat it, I'm going to eat it, baby. Come on, give me some butter. Anybody have a stick of butter? Come forward. Listen. Here's my point. Last night they brought out delicious bread. And I ate the bread and I said, okay, that's fine. I'm done. You think so? No way. A steak came out with some other, I forgot how it's pronounced, but change your whole life. Come on. Great food. God has given us bread and we're staying with, it's only men as trees walking. We're glad. We're maybe used in one of the gifts of the Spirit. Maybe we've, had, maybe we've seen one miracle. Maybe we've got five kids and four of them are saved and one isn't. And we're saying, it's okay, it's good enough. Maybe, maybe we're 20 or 30 or 50 or $100,000 in debt and now we got it down to 10 or 5 or 3,500. We're saying good enough. God's saying no. Don't settle for men as trees walking. Don't settle for a half-finished building. Don't settle for two church vans. Don't settle for some kids. Don't settle for some teenagers. Let's keep going. Let's step forward. Are you willing to let him touch you one more time, Pastor? Come on up. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise in this place this morning.